Now, I actually have a decent title for my message. Most of my message are, titles are like horrendous. Like if I'm preaching a series on prayer, you know, Prayer Week 1, 2015, that's like a pretty good title for me. So I'm not, but I have a title for this message, okay? So who's here ready to hear my title? Okay. Blessed Unity Out of Messy Community. Huh? Okay, you like that? Okay, I'll say it again. Blessed unity out of messy community. Father, I pray that we would get it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus said this. He said, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that you may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. Where there is unity, I want you to hear this, prayers are answered. How many people need some more of that? Okay. Where there is unity, Jesus shows up. And you don't need a hundred people to be in unity. It says if two or three are gathered together, if you're really together in your soul and your spirit and your purpose, two or three of them, hi little toes, and um, two or three together, Jesus says, I am there in the midst. Blessed unity. One of the most poignant and powerful scriptures about unity comes from David, the psalm, Psalm 133. And I'd like you to pay very careful attention to the terminology and the illustrations represented in the scripture. It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robe. And this is a very stately picture. Bill, will you stand up? Come on, everybody look at that. Now that's a beard. Carl, eat your heart out. Okay? Now that's a beard. But okay, so you have somebody, you have a high priest in a priestly garment, and the oil of God is poured upon the head. And it literally, we're not talking a little dab will do you. It's talking about they would pour the vial, the bottle, the flask of oil, and it would come down. And the thick oil from a ro- had a beautiful aroma, and it would pour down his beard, and it would cover his, his being, his breastplate. It would cover down to the edge of his garment, which just about the floor. Hallelujah. And, and the, the oil represents anointing. It represents blessing. It represents the presence of God. And it says when brothers get together in unity, it's like the oil. And you, you could see that high priestly illustration being anointed. Hallelujah. And affecting the whole body. And we know that the church is the body of Christ. And when there's unity, the anointing goes from the head to the toes in Jesus' name. Can everybody bask in that picture? But it goes on. It says in verse 3, it said, it is like the dew of Hermon. Everybody say, hey, Hermie. Now, Hermie is not a person. It's a mountain. It's an area. It's a region in Israel. It's way up in the north, Mount Hermon. And it says, the brothers getting together in unity, the anointing of God flowing from the head to the, to the toes in the body of Christ, is like dew falling on Mount Hermon, coming down upon the mountain of Zion. Well, Zion is Jerusalem area. It's in the southern part of Israel. And so powerful as brothers getting together in unity. It's like the anointing on the high priest covering his whole body. Hallelujah. It's like they are being due in Mount Hermon and your garden being watered down in Jerusalem area. It's like how many people know Vermont is a far way, far, far away from my garden in South Jersey? It's like dew in the white mountains of Vermont watering my garden in New Jersey. It's it's an impossibility. But that is the power of unity when brothers get together. And now, just so everybody knows, when I'm talking about the brotherhood, when the Bible's talking about the brotherhood, it includes the sisterhood. Okay? So there is no division in the body of Christ. Can you say amen? For all the brotherhoods and the sisterhoods. Where is the anointing released? Where does the blessing flow? Where is a state that is good and pleasant? It is where the brothers dwell together in unity. Is there an amen in this house? 
Hallelujah. The Bible says here in that last part, for the Lord has commanded a blessing there forevermore. It's in unity that God has commanded a blessing. Amen. Does anybody know the story that, that is recorded um, in Luke chapter 5? Okay, in Luke chapter 5, it's a very powerful story. Um, th- th- there is a, Jesus is teaching in a house, and it's a packed house. It's crammed to the gill. Now, um, ha- has anybody here ever heard that, you know, it's, they're crammed like more than sardines in a can? Now, how many people know that anchovies and sardines are of the devil? And I can prove it to you. You put one little anchovy on a pizza. One. There's eight slices and you put it right in the middle of one. You put that in the oven. That sardine or anchovy will swim through every piece of pizza. And it will put this vile, disgusting, demonic taste and smell over. It's way over here and the slice over here tastes like dead fish. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? My wife's saying, I love those little fishies. Ew. And I kiss you. I'm telling you, it must be love. (laughs) Hallelujah. And and they were packed in the house like sardines. They were squished and packed. Even in the doorway, no one can get in there. And the Bible specifically says in Luke chapter 5, it says that the presence of the Lord was present to heal the sick. Among, in that house, among the multitudes that were packed into that house. But nobody was healed. Something was missing. What was missing from receiving the blessing of healing? As in a few minutes when we get to that story, we're going to see that, that unity was something that would release the power from being present to being experienced. Because it's in unity that the blessing is commanded. Now, does anybody know somebody that drives you crazy? Because there is no consistency in their life. One day they want to be your best friend. And the next day they are, you're not good enough to wash their, their feet. Did you ever meet somebody that one way they were this way and one way all they wanted from you was so-and-so and and then then a a week later you meet them and they're like, they're like, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, they have a total different agenda for your life. You know what I mean? They wanted you to do this and now they could, whatever. But there's no consistency. Well, I'm here to declare to you that my God is consistent. And he's consistent about what's important to him. And he's inconsistent about what he wants in your life. He, is, he, he has a plan for your life on day one that's similar to, your, to, to when you're 101. My God is consistent. God has an de- agenda for you and he has an de- agenda for this church. And clearly, relationships, fellowship, Knowing, caring, brotherhood, dwelling together in unity is the atmosphere in which God delights and releases his abundance. That is God's goal from you from the beginning to the end, is for you to be in fellowship with your brothers, to develop to the level where you literally function in a spirit of unity, of grace, of mercy, and kindness. God is calling you to that. Now, I want to teach you a few things about that because there's a, there's a little catch here. Okay, and I want us to go back to Adam. Everything was going great in Adam's life. Okay, God was giving Adam's commands, and he was obeying the commands. God said, name all the animals. He said, monkey, he said, giraffe, he said, blowfish. Okay, he named all the birds and all the fishes, okay? And, um, and he, did, he was doing great. He had plenty of food. He had no problem. He was chilling out. He had control over his clicker. All the important things of life. Everything was good. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't, he wasn't involved in sin. He wasn't being tempted and, and having all these major problems. And then God spoke into his life. And you know what God said? It says in Genesis, see, up until this time, Adam's life was not messy. And then God said in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. 
I will make a helper suitable for him. How many people know that that's true? And that's exactly what God did. Now, even though Adam received his God-ordained helpmate, it brought him stress, chaos, and a whole lot of mess. He was doing fine before God says it's, it's not good for you to be alone. He had so much less stress. No, am, am I making this up? Does anybody know? I'm pro-marriage. I'm pro-family, okay? But, it, but I, you need to understand that relationships involve mess. And that is the will of God. See, there's some people want to be in a fairy tale. They want relationships and fellowship. They want to be part of a church where nobody messes with them. Relationships are... Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And yes, that is God's plan. It was God's plan from the beginning, and it'll be God's plan in the end. You can take a season in your life and try to run away from relationships, run away from being close to people. You can, you can think that you could put up these walls to protect yourself. You could think that you'll be doing fine. You could still love God. How many times have I heard people say, you know, I can have church in the woods? Are you a monkey? You could have church in the words. You can also rub poison ivy all over your body. There's a lot of stupid things you can do. Now, I am not saying you should never have a church service going out in the woods and praying and seeking God. I think everybody knows what I'm saying. Hallelujah. It's not what the plan of God to avoid other people that are messy because they're messy. It's God's plan for that. And so what did God do? The Lord God fashioned... Um, into a woman from the rib that he had taken from man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Hallelujah. I want you to know that was God's plan, and it was messy. Hallelujah. And they shall become one flesh. That was God's plan, and it turned out really messy. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Being in relationship, community, involved with other human beings is the flow of life. It's the flow of God's kingdom. It's God's plan and perfect will for you. But it's also the area where the enemy will attack. It's also the, the area where the world systems will attack. And these relationships will prove these God-ordained relationships will prove to be messy. The call of God, the kingdom of God, the flow of God from the beginning to end is to live in community. Hallelujah. And that is why the enemy is so determined to destroy relationships. The enemy wants to destroy relationships at or with you and God. First thing, he wants to destroy your relationship with God. And one of, the, one of the ways that the enemy destroys your relationship with God is bringing people into your life that God wants in your life and letting them be messy. And you get an upset and you get an offended and you get disappointed and you, you actually getting to see their humanity and not liking it because they got attitudes that rub you the wrong way and everybody know that you're God's favorite. And so if they're rubbing you the wrong way, they must be really bad. And they might be. And it might still be God's will for them to be in your life. Because relationships are messy. Hallelujah, the enemy wants to destroy your relationships at home. Let me tell you something. Your mom's your mom, your dad's your dad, your brother and sisters are your brother and sisters. That's right. That's who you got. You've got a lot of reason. I, I remember my grandpapa, my dad is a great man, and one of the things I loved about my dad is, is that he, he showed me how to love his relatives. My, um, my grandpa left my dad when he was six years old. My dad found my grandpa when he was married because my mom made him. All they knew was my dad, my grandpa's name was Robert Siegel. Um, all they knew is that he lived in Chicago somewhere. Back in the day where they had operators, hello, operator number 459, okay? 
they got a kind operator in the Chicago area to give them the number of every Robert or Bob Siegel in the Chicago area. And my mom and my father called every Robert Siegel and then they tracked down my grandfather. And let me tell you something, my grandfather lived to 101. And every, just about every experience I had with my grandfather is he was negative and a nasty man. But I never remember a holiday that went by where my father didn't call his father and show him love and kindness. Messy. But God's will is messy. Hello, God wants to destroy the homes, your workplace. God will, it's God ordained for you to work with some jerks. Seriously, some people don't like that word. I don't know what other word I can use. But wherever you work, there'll be people that are potato heads. How bad is that? A little nicer word? Mr. Potato Head, if that serves you better. Whatever, okay? But there will be people at work that will rub you the wrong way. And guess what? God planned it that way. Hallelujah. People are messy. God wants you in mess. Hallelujah. Work at school, at play. And yes, even at church. Some people think because all the people that come to church love Jesus, that they'll all be sweet and kind to you and like you at every moment. It won't happen. There will be people that you walk in the church parking lot. Oh, the other day you want to hear something fun. This is true. I get here early. And, I'm, and I'm, it was actually last Sunday. Clarence, he's with the men. A bunch of the men and women are on a trip to um, Oklahoma. And so I'm driving. Oh, my, my wife's here. I hope I told you this story. So I'm driving your car to church last week. And um, I said, oh, look, I got a few minutes ahead of time. I'm going to go get gas. So I pulled into the gas station, got gas, and I'm pulling out of the gas station, and I didn't really look clear enough, and I cut Clarence off. At the, off. And um, I did that. I really did. Now, Clarence is like about the nicest guy in the whole world. And I saw him, and he looked at me like, okay. And um, so I said, I, I said go, you could go. And I apologize. I mean, I really felt bad. I, how many people know when you're wrong, don't try to fake it? You know, when you, when you mess up, say, hey, I'm sorry. And so... You know, I thought it was Clarence, and we're going down, so we're both going to church. So here he's coming to church, and the pastor tries to call, cut him off. So he, we go in, and I say, hey, Clarence, I'm really sorry. And he goes, oh, no, it's okay. And um, he just said, I'm glad I didn't try to cuss you out. <laughs> Come on, we all got to grow up. Real life happens in church. Mess happens in church. People get mad at, at church. I can almost guarantee you sooner or later, somebody, now I don't believe in cussing, but somebody might cuss at you in church. I remember once I was pastoring the church, and I came in there singing. I was so happy to be in the house of God. Now, there were some problems in the church at that time. And one of the, one of the, um, the, the leaders of the church was this giant man. He had these big hands. He was an old-school farmer. And he was ticked at me that I could come to church happy when he wasn't. And he was about ready to pummel me. I mean, he was like, how could you be happy, Pastor? People are unhappy. And I said, hey, I know that. But I'm here to love Jesus. Can you say amen? I didn't, get, I didn't let that, that, that affect my life. Guess what? I'm not, I'm not here for man's flesh. I'm here to help us walk in the Spirit. And let me say this. I can almost guarantee you one thing. That if you, if you come to this church long enough, you'll see a time when I'm not in the Spirit, when I'm in the flesh. Because I don't walk on water. I haven't turned the five loaves into 5,000. Those are proof, and to feed the 5,000. Maybe someday that will happen. But right now, some days you'll get Pastor Ralph, and some days you might get Ralph. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's good. But Ralph's okay. Can I tell you something? God, God saved Ralph. God loves Ralph. Hallelujah. Amen. God, you know, every Sunday morning, God gives Ralph chocolate. Eat your heart out. <laughs> Seriously, somebody gives me a piece of chocolate every Sunday. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Relationships are hard and often messy. Think about this. It, it only took four chapters. Four chapters. Four chapters. And really, if you take away chapter one, God created man in chapter two. So it really only took three chapters for, for men to turn the beautiful creation into mayhem, mess, and murder. Just three chapters. You know, from chapters two, three, and four, it went from perfect creation to mayhem, mess, and murder. 
That's all it took. Men and people are messy. Think about that in those three chapters. Eve disobeyed God, encouraged Adam to join the mess. They pointed fingers at each other. They played a professional round of the blame game. And the next generation between Cain and Abel saw jealousy murder as was, and murder as a result of sin. In just three chapters. And you're complaining of your mess. Come on now. Mess caused by relationships are a main occurrence in the Bible. Listen to the greats. Noah, the man of faith and obedience. At the end of his obedience, he got drunk, got naked. His, one of his sons came in there and told his other brothers to, and um, brought a curse upon one-third of Noah's whole generation. Pretty messy business. Abraham, he had problems. He decided God's will was to bring Lot along with him, and it was God's will. It wasn't long between Lot's servants and Abraham's servants were fighting and quarreling over grazing lands, okay? And what about Hagar? Does anybody know the story about Hagar? That's pretty messy stuff, hallelujah. I don't need to go into that. And then even Sarah, even Abraham and Sarah, they had some messy things going on. Abraham wanted to keep Ishmael, and Sarah said to let him go. Sarah was fighting with Hagar. It was a lot of mess, even with the father of our faith. Now, Joseph is a man that you, is one of the few men in the whole Bible that there's no, you can't find any sin in his life. How many people know Joseph, Joseph walked right and in integrity through, throughout his whole life, according to Scripture, okay? But, man, he had mess. All of his brothers, all of his brothers were against him. They threw him in a, They were so mad at him. There was so much um, anger towards him that they threw him in a pit ready to kill him but sold him as a slave. He had a lot of mess in his life. And then he was sold to Potiphar. And how about Potiphar's wife? How about that relationship? Did he bargain for that? Did he provoke that? Did he encourage that mess in his life? But it was God's will for him to be in relationship with Potiphar and his wife in spite of the mess. Because it's gold comes out of the mess. Characters born out of messy life. Is there an amen in the house? Does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? Hallelujah. Now, David, I forget it. We could spend hours talking about the mess in his life, the mess in Moe's life. Hallelujah. People often, often make our life like a soap opera. Even Jesus Christ, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus calls 12 men to be his disciples and follow him. And he was going to train them up and send them out. How long was it before they were arguing who was going to be graded in his kingdom? And then when Jesus needed him most at the time of the cross... They abandoned him, abandoned him to a, an angry crowd. Mess, mess, mess. The kingdom of God is a mess. The church is a mess. And it's God's plan and God's way for your life to be involved in mess. You know, it's so funny when you see newlyweds get married and they're so loved. And they don't have any problems. When I start counseling people and they say, you know, we've never fought it. We love each other so much. I say, you got some surprises coming. Because <laughs> he ain't that good looking. Real life is real messy. Let's go back to our story um, in Luke chapter 5. And remember, verse 17, you could throw it up on the screen. It says, the power of the Lord was present, um, for, was present for him to perform healings. And, um, but we, we stated that nobody was healed. And one of the reasons why they weren't applying the unity as expressed in Matthew 18 and Psalm 130, that would release anointing, bring the blessing, bring prayers answered. Bring Jesus to show up. He was there. How many people know it's different from Jesus being there and Jesus showing up in all his power and his glory? Now, unity is messy because you get connected with people, real people, falling people, people that have needs and demands. Sometimes we can't sing, he ain't heavy, he's my brother anymore because our back hurts too much and our knees ache. Hallelujah. And we're sick and tired of being the, always the one who are helping and serving. And we're feeling empty and unappreciated. 
However, this story, we see unity. We see that these people had a small group. This paralyzed man had a small group. Hallelujah. They had a small group of people that surrounded him, that saw him as somebody not who was crippled, somebody not who was deficient, but they saw him as somebody who was loved, worthy of care, and worthy of God's blessing. And, um, and, and, and these four men carried him on his mat. Now, these friends took their buddies with his needs, and they took that person's need as their own. And that's where unity starts happening, when we start getting really involved in people's mess. When we, when we open up our heart to say, I'm going to know you. I'm going to know all about you. I'm going lo- I'm gonna, to I'm gonna love the good, the bad, and the ugly. How many people know that people that have chronic illnesses don't always have chronically good attitudes? How many people know chronic illnesses wear on your soul, can wear on your attitudes? Hello, have you ever been buffeted and, and, and attacked repeatedly over and over? Have you ever had a, a mountain of emotion piled on you? But these people, even in spite of where this man was, they, 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 they unified, they united with him. They took his need as their own need, and they carried him, and they carried him to that, that house because they heard Jesus was there, but they couldn't get in the house because of the crowd. Now, they could have took the un messy way out and said, you know, Jesus is in there and he's got to get out of there. Out of there, there's only one door. We're going to plop you down here. We're going to go and do our, what we need to do, do our chores at our home. And when he comes out, you can ask him to pray for you. And you know, we'll be back for you at sundown. He, they could have done that. But mess, unity says mess. Unity says we're going to see this need to the end. Hallelujah. And so what did they do? They took this man and they, they climbed up on the roof. They carried him up on the roof and they cleared the roof away. They put a big hole in the roof. And it doesn't matter that it was dangerous. It didn't matter that, that, that the, the owner of the house would get ticked off at them. How many people know when you put a hole the size of a grown man on a mat, somebody's going to be a little mad. It doesn't matter. And they lowered him down. And they became part of the headline news. Because they entered into somebody's mess. You got a lot of mess, don't you? It's the will and the plan, the flow of God and his kingdom. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about, an irrational love, a crazy caring Christian community, the brotherhood of the saints. It demands sweat equity, which is the seed of this miracle. Hallelujah. One definition of love is sweat, is the sweat we, will, we are willing to give in our pursuit of serving one another. The sweat that we're willing to give in the pursuit of loving one another. Now that's messy. That's community. That's the church. Now that's the heart of what we're striving for here at Victory. Hallelujah. That's why we have growth groups and we're asking you to sign up for them. I see a lot of um, Kayafa guys here. That's awesome. Hallelujah. They have growth groups on campus. They might call them cell groups or care groups or fellow, fellowship groups or whatever they want to call them. Join them. Hallelujah. Get close to one another. Give yourselves to each other. Pray with each other. Meet for early morning prayer. Meet for late morning prayer. So a Christian community needs to be our priority. We need to jump into the mess. In verse 20 of chapter 5 in Luke, in the story, it says when Jesus saw saw their faith, Jesus healed him and forgave him when he saw their faith. Their faith. Faith in the form of sweat. Faith in the form of getting involved. Faith in the form of inconvenience. Faith in the form of caring and loving and serving. This man's legs were made whole because their legs carried him to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Community draws people together, draws them together. Hallelujah. In such a way that they're willing to climb a roof. Now, three of them might not have been able to carry man up there. Two of them definitely couldn't. One of them wasn't going to be enough. But that small band of brotherhood, that group of four, were able to see God do a great miracle. You know, I see that. So many times I'm looking around and I'm seeing some of our seniors and I know that some of them are invited over for meals at people's houses during the holidays. 
you know, um, I see Stephanie and Howard and how they reach out to the, the junior high kids and, and take them as their own. Hallelujah. Fifthians, are you really going to adapt another kid? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's, you, don't you have enough mess already? Um, Hallelujah. How about Judy cooking for the senior citizens once a month and taking care of the food fellowship? All that stuff is messy. You don't believe that? Go look at her car. It's not a, her van is not a car. It's a food pantry. Hallelujah. It's all messy. Doing something for Jesus is messy. You know, all the people that, that reached down and prayed with my wife and I through our times of pain and sorrows, it was messy. We're messy sometimes. Hallelujah. Um, all the people that helped donate 5,003 pairs of socks for the homeless and people getting involved in the food pantry. It's all messy. Uh, Mr. Ken, bring in the middle of a snowstorm, bringing down a generator for Anna so her food pump will work when their electricity went up. Real life, real faith, real church is messy, and it's meant to be that. It's God-ordained to be messy. Brothers and sisters who go beyond themselves to carry a brother up on a mat, up to a roof to meet Jesus. Messy, but it's God's plan. Get messy. We all messy. Become a pig for Jesus. <laughs> Serious. You're too clean. You want to keep Jesus all nice and neat like over here. Do you know what I mean? religious, too religious. Get in somebody's life. Hang out with somebody that makes you mad. And just try to love them for Christ. Amen. The big question in conclusion, I'd like to ask a, quick, a big question and, and answer it with three thoughts. The big question is how do we get through all the mess without becoming bitter, discouraged, or people fatigued? Bitter, discouraged, or people fatigued. There is mess in the church. There's mess everywhere. If there are people, it's messy. Has anybody, can, you, can you think of a time when there wasn't mess? You get married, it's messy. You get married for love. You get, God knows you get married so he could throw you in some mess. So you see what you deal with. But how do you deal with the mess without getting bitter, discouraged, or people fatigued? The first thing, now listen to me. I have three thoughts here. The first one is by following God's ways and God's attitude in the midst of the mess. While it's all messy, while you're getting mad about what they said, what they did, well, you're, you're, you're waving your, your right to be, to be really upset and retaliate back. Well, you're waving your right to get hurt and offended. Make sure you're following God's ways and God's attitude. Is that, ask yourself, is that, is it, the way I'm reacting, is that God's attitude? Is, that God, is this God's way? Remember what happened to Adam when he and Eve followed the other guy's advice. So while things are messy, ask God what is his way in this mess. And what is his attitude? The second one is a sort of a tongue twister. Can you put that up? I want you to read it with me. We'll read it slowly at first. Okay? All right. On your marker, take go. Mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Again, mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Again, mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Again, mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. A little faster. Mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Now, what does that mean? We're, you're going to be in a mess. What are you going to mirror? Are you going to mirror the attitude of the person that's creating the mess? How many people know in this day and age there are not only drama queens in your life, there are some drama kings in your life? Hallelujah. Okay, that's right. All right. And what are you going to mirror? Are you going to mirror those who are creating drama or you are going to mirror God's love? You will have mess. Let me tell you this. Some of you, God won't take the mess away 
until you stop mirroring the mess. And stop, until you stop adding fuel to the fire. Until, it, until you learn to respond in the grace of Jesus. Not mirroring the attitude that are bringing the chaos in your life. Know that you are called to be the light in the darkness, a calm in the storm, and steady in the mess. How many people have ever heard of Ghostbusters? Well, God wants you to be drama busters. In the midst of the drama, he wants you to mirror God's love. Can you say amen? Go back there. I'm not done. I'm not done with number two. On the count of three, who thinks they could say it faster than me? One, two, three. Mirror God's love in the mess, not the mess of the mess makers. Okay, you could go to number three. Thank you. I do not believe that anybody beat me. And if you did beat me, you'll make my life messy, so watch out. Okay, number three thought that I had. You are called to meet God and focus on God in the midst of the mess. You have a calling in your life. You, you, mess is coming. Mess is coming. And you, but you're, this is the thing. You're called to meet God in that mess. You're called to focus on God in the mess. Mess is coming. Well, you've got how many sheep? you got, you, yeah, you got a whole bunch. She just had 17 or 19 more baby sheep in the last week or so. 17 baby sheep. Everybody give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the midst of your mess, in the midst of your mess, focus on God. Hallelujah. Commit yourself to love God, to love others in the mess. These are three thoughts. Forgive somebody today. Let a grudge go today. Give up a demand today. Now, this is also something good. Do something for someone that has made your life messy, that is unexpected and totally kind. Think of somebody in your life that has really made your life messy. And do something that's totally unexpected and totally kind. Some of you are saying, which one of the 20 people? <laughs> Let's get messy. Let's join a group. Join a ministry. Invite people in. Invite people out. Get together and pray with some people. Reach out to others. Go to lunch. Have somebody take you out for lunch. Say, who's taking me out for lunch today? I'm hungry. Just do it. Get together in their mess. Hallelujah. Look for a need. Meet a need. Look for a man on a mat and fall in love with them to, until you're willing to climb up on top of a roof and help that man meet Jesus.